Hello, Chris Conroy here. It's true to say that since its inception about 15 years ago, the ultralight movement set about the reinvention of the aeroplane. From its inception, designers seemed to go through the same processes of aerodynamic and engineering refinement to that followed by the pioneers, with one exception, and this relates to engines. The early pioneers had the advantage of a service industry which was eager to supply engines which were relevant to the airframes. In our case, we were forced to adapt industrial and snowmobile engines to our purposes with sometimes dire results. That is, until Rotax came into the picture. This Austrian company, which had been building a wide range of industrial engines for many years, saw the potential for purpose-designed and engineered light aircraft engines, and they've provided reliable power plants in a wide range of horsepowers. With one exception, the four-stroke four-cylinder 912, these engines are two-strokes, and this aspect of their design places constraints upon their operation which are only now being understood. They require an entirely different attitude to maintenance and must receive a degree of care and attention during their operational lives which is entirely different to that required by four-strokes. As well, the air navigation orders in Australia covering ultralight aircraft allow an owner to conduct his own maintenance, and this extends to major overhaul and repair of the engine. Many of Australia's operators live and work in remote areas, and this makes the dissemination of detailed maintenance information difficult at best. To help overcome these problems and to give operators information which allows them to maintain and overhaul their power plants in the field, Ostflight Aviation at Booner in Queensland applied for a grant for the production of a manual and this video. The Federal Department of Primary Industries and Energy through the Department of Education, Employment and Training made the grant under the innovative Rural Education and Training Program and the manual was written by Ron North. This video supplements our production on the maintenance of ultralights in rural operations which was similarly funded. Ausflight are manufacturers of the Australian Drifter and run an assembly plant at Boona. They also operate six aircraft in a flying school, so their utilisation is very high. Dick Ecott is their chief engineer, and as a result of the high hours flown, has more experience than most in the care and maintenance of Rotax engines. The purpose of this video is to supplement the written manual and show firsthand how all of the operations are conducted. We've disregarded the runtime of the production in the interest of making the video as concise and comprehensive as possible. As a result of this, the runtime of this video, which is close to five hours, supersedes just about any other similar production. But it is indexed uh, on the cover, so that enables you to turn to the section that you're particularly interested in as and when you require it. Dick Ecott will be taking you through the entire operation of dismantling, assessing, repairing and reassembling the engine step by step. Dick, we, we have to pull the, the engine out of the airframe. Let's just go through the steps that are involved in that. Yes, fine Chris, okay. Well, uh, of course in our application, uh, this is a, a pusher type uh, um, application on this aircraft. We'd be looking at, uh, because it's a water-cooled engine, we're draining the, the cooling system. Uh, on this particular application there is no uh, tap as such uh, that you can drain, so you're removing a hose. Uh, we've drained the system, we would be looking to detach the propeller. Um, they secured by lock wire, so we're just cutting the uh, lock wire, removing the bolts, clear the propeller. We have fuel lines of course, we would just be disconnecting the main suction line. That's from the fuel tank itself? From the fuel tank, yes, uh, from the suction line. Uh, we have, of course, this is an electric start engine. We have various uh, looms and uh, an electrical wiring going in, which these days is just a plug and possibly just a couple of connections for the gauges. Uh, that basically uh, uh, clears the engine. Uh, we have an exhaust pipe in this installation. Uh, it needs to be detached uh, from the side of the cylinder area uh, via the manifold and we can leave the muffler. This particular installation uh, is an uh, upright mount and we have attachment points on a mounting plate. Uh, we have to take the whole lot off on this, uh, this installation. On our earlier inverted uh, uh, installation, the muffler can be left attached to the aircraft. 
Dick, in uh, say an inverted installation, do you take steps to support the engine when you undo the main mounting bolts? Yes, that's uh, that's correct, Chris. You would need to uh, to be supporting it as you are taking the bolts out. Uh, generally by some lifting means or support rope around the frame, something of that nature. Right. Okay, now we've got the engine off and we have it mounted on the special engine work stand there. This is a, uh, a rebuild stand put out by, uh, by Rotax. It's a very invaluable tool when you're doing them all the time and it just makes it very convenient uh, to save you walking around your workbench area. Uh, you can just rotate the, uh, the engine to the particular p position that you require. That's obviously a piece of professional workshop equipment, Dick. Uh, just uh, a good solid clean bench and a block to hold the engine up and make sure that it's solid and rigid would be enough, wouldn't it? Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. Um, as long as you've got a nice uh, clean area, uh, they can be quite easily handled on, uh, on any uh, type of bench. Dick, the disassembly procedure is, uh, is fairly simple. Yes, Chris, there's, uh, there's not too much in them. Uh, fortunately, uh, there is a, a, quite a few accessories attached to the engine, uh, but there is not a great deal in removing those. Uh, Where we would, do we start? We'd start off by possibly removing the, uh, the starter motor, clearing the access to the ignition um, flywheel area. Now the starter motor is mounted on that, that rear plate there. The housing uh, the attached housing, to the yeah. back here, yes. Uh, we would then be look at, uh, looking at removing the fuel system, two attachment bolts here and a, uh, a few clamps around the carburetor areas and uh, that will all come away. Now, uh, just let's go back a second. When we took it out of the aircraft, what did we do with the throttle cables? The throttle cables just come off uh, via the slides um, and it can then just be uh, So you take the tops attached. off the carburetors and, and um, disassemble the throttle inner cables from the actual carburetor slides? That's correct, yes. They just have uh, swages on the bottom of the cable. They will clear through the slides so they come out cleanly and, uh, and are just left with the aircraft. Alright, well back to the carburetors. The carburetors are attached to the engine side plate there. They are attached via a uh, rubber uh, socket with just a special type of clamp so you just undo the clamp and you can withdraw the carburetor straight out? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Then what? The ignition system? We would then be looking at taking the ignition packs off. Uh, they're mounted on the engine via a backing plate. Um, high tension cables to the spark plugs. Um, not very much entailed there at all. And what about the cooling system? Cooling system on this particular model is the engine attached radiators. We have twin radiators. Uh, upper mounting brackets, uh, four or five nuts and uh, the whole assembly comes away rather quickly. Okay, now that leaves the engine an open book, it's stripped bare. We have all the accessories basically removed at that stage, we just have uh, cylinder head cylinders and this uh, style of thing to come off. Okay, we've got the engine stripped ready to start major disassembly. Dick, before we go any further, I noticed that you put protective caps in all the apertures in the engine. What's the reason for how important is that? Well, it's very important, uh, Chris, um, if you're only doing various ancillary work around the engine, for instance, removing the carburetors to work on them, uh, or the, uh, the rotary valve, oil bottle or shaft area, we want to be able to cover up these openings that we're not working with or further componentry that we're not pulling off stop any dirt and grit and uh, foreign matter that might transgress into there. The mud wasps and things like that. Well of course, yeah, <laughs> if it's left for that period of time uh, that they're a problem. Now what are the effects of those contaminants on the inside of the engine? Well as you know Chris, uh, dirt and uh, silica and what have you is uh, disastrous to the likes of uh, ball bearings, uh, shafts and uh, seals so we certainly want to keep those uh, contaminants out of there, uh, save scratching and scoring to those sort of surfaces. Which could not only lead to shorter engine life but could also lead to engine failure in extreme circumstances. Yeah well that's correct uh, because it's not something that you can uh, you can count on as far as uh, maintenance, uh, you're just going to end up with a premature failure and, uh, and a disastrous incident. Dick, uh, just on that, still on that subject, um, the, the, this tape is being made for people who operate these engines in remote areas and remote areas suggest a fairly hostile environment with dust and dirt and sand and grit blowing around. What are the ramifications of, of that for the engine? 
Yes, yeah, so well, problems there, of course. We, uh, we can't stand any restriction in the, uh, in the fuel system. Uh, we have uh, small openings in carburetors and, uh, and fuel pumps. Uh, you get restricted fuel filters, so we get a restriction, a leaning out of the fuel, excess temperatures uh, resulting in piston seizures, this sort of thing. There are preventatives that we can do, uh, that the owner can do overnight by putting uh, uh, covers over various uh, apertures that are open uh, to stop some of these things getting in uh, just from natural occurrences. And air filters on the carburetors and that sort of thing? Yes, Chris. Approximately every 25 hours or so, air filters should be washed in a detergent and water mix, flushed with clean water, air dried and re-oiled using the correct air filter oil. Now what about contaminants that are carried in the fuel? You mentioned filters before and you can't afford to have restrictions. It is possible to filter the fuel before it, it goes into the tank and while it's going into the tank as well, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. We, uh, we do sell and, uh, and recommend a Mr Funnel, uh, which is a very fine uh, gauze type uh, filter arrangement which will take out uh, any water that happens to be in the fuel, a uh, very fine micron mesh which will take most contaminants out, uh, preventing them even transgressing into the, uh, the fuel filter that's already so, established. So that stops a long term build up of, uh, of contaminants in the fuel tank itself? <laughs> Yes, I guess that certainly would. There are some things that uh, some people could be putting in, drum liners, avgas drums, uh, the linings do come off. All these little bits and pieces can float around and then uh, accumulate in the, in the likes of fittings and hoses and what have you. Of course, one of the problems is that uh, if the aircraft is, is operated, say, straight and level for a, a lengthy period of time and then uh, it either comes in contact with extremely turbulent air or has a fairly hard landing or taxis over very rough ground, that build-up of grit and contaminants which has remained stable in the, the sump in the tank can be stirred up into the fuel and actually taken through into the engine, can't it? Yes, so that's you can great, have a yeah. problem that from a time point of view was well remote from the time that the actual grit and stuff got into the fuel tank. Yes, that's, uh, that's correct, Chris, and those are the sort of things that uh um, may happen to one particular person and not happen to another so uh, um, troubleshooting and, and diagnostic type things you know have to be taken uh, on particular basis of what uh, you or the aircraft may have just uh, experienced in, in relationship to uh, finding a problem. Alright well um, obviously the message there is to be careful in all aspects of, uh, of the operation of your aircraft and of your engine particularly with the, uh, with the fuel systems and particularly with making sure that the engine is covered and is protected from access by dust, grit, mud wasps and that sort of thing. Back to, uh, to tearing the engine down, back into the workshop. Uh, as we said, the engine is ready for major uh, dismantling which involves the removal of the cylinder head. Um, yes, that's quite correct. We're up to the stage now of, uh, of removing the, uh, the cylinder head and then uh, transgressing on to removing the cylinders. Is there anything in particular we should know about that? Um, no, not, uh, not particularly. Um, just possibly in reverse order of the tightening sequence in, uh, in taking the nuts off. Um, now the tightening sequence is in the manual, isn't it? It's correct, yes. It's, uh, it's illustrated in the current manuals. Okay, because you can do just as much damage by loosening the acorn, acorn nuts in the wrong sequence as you can by either talking them to the wrong value or tightening them in the wrong sequence, can't you? Yes, that's correct. Uh, possibly more, uh, more with this engine as well because uh, uh, being a water cooled, there are rather large square type uh, rubber gaskets uh, which put a fair amount of uh, pressure on the head, um, especially if you were very quick and you were doing it while the engine maybe is still warm. There's a possibility by just loosening off one end uh, instead of working outwards that uh, you may have too much pressure. Alright, well we've got the cylinder head off uh, and now it's time to attack the cylinders. Okay, the cylinders are head on, held on with uh, bolts down inside the water jacket there. Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. They have made a few changes on these current engines. Uh, we have a uh, hexagon head cap screw, just four bolts retaining each of the cylinders. Now I notice that you, you undo those uh, diagonally rather than going around. 
Yes, it's just a practice generally uh, adopted whenever you're undoing uh, most things. But uh, undo opposites. Just re helps relieve the uh, the stress equally. I might also just note, uh, Chris, um, with all these particular engines, we, uh, we generally number the cylinders, that is uh, the PTO end cylinder or the mag end cylinder, uh, likewise with the air-cooled 503s, uh, because you have single heads, you likewise uh, number those. They are matched from the factory, and if, for instance, you were putting oversized cylinders, you would need to match them up, and make sure that they're going to fit the uh, adjacent cylinder. Because um, they obviously have to be exactly the same height because the cylinder head itself is in one piece. And that would set up tremendous stresses in the, uh, in the overall engine and crankcase if the cylinders weren't, in fact, exactly the same height. Yes, that's a very valid point with the uh, water cool one, of course, with having a single head um, and two cylinders. The other point to uh, remember as well, the lining up of the faces of the carburetor or the exhaust manifold, for instance, can also vary, uh, which was going to tend to want to pull the cylinder around. Uh, it's not quite so bad when you have the twin carby uh, engine uh, but in the likes of um, the liquid cooled one, you have a common uh, carrier plate or, or housing for the carburetors, and uh, the two cylinders have to be aligned uh, uh, quite correctly. So do you do that with a straight edge? We'll obviously look at that during the reassembly process. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Now, Dick, you, you're going to mark the cylinders now so that they can be identified. What do you do there? Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. We normally just scratch in an area that's uh, sort of not, uh, can't directly uh, notice so as to spoil anything, and we just mark uh, the mag cylinder and the PTO cylinder uh, just on the exhaust flange or somewhere of that nature. So you, you could put F and R on it, couldn't you? Well, n yes, you could, but just in some uh, applications, um, for instance, if you're doing an engine but you don't really know possibly what it came out of, this may be, this may be the front, it may be the rear, depending on whether it's a, a tractor or a pusher application. So we like to, to number it PTO and MAG so that okay, you can't now get them mixed those up. Those cylinders are gasketed down onto the crankcase. Um, they're obviously not going to fall off. Uh, what's the procedure for, uh, for breaking the seal and, uh, and lifting them off? Yes, well normally uh, you don't like to be uh, uh, jamming, in, jamming them off with uh, uh, screwdrivers or, uh, or podgy bars or this sort of thing. So generally just a, uh, a bit of a tap with a uh, rubber or um, fibre type uh, hammer generally clears them. Generally. <laughs> right. Right, well that came free fairly easily. Dick, you obviously support the cylinder with your other hand in case it's, uh, it's loose as that one was and it, uh, if you're not holding on to it, it'll tumble onto the floor. Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. Sometimes they do tend to stick a little bit and uh, you haven't got a great deal of the piston in the chamber. There it is just liable to, uh, to detach itself and, and come crashing so off. So you just lift yeah. the cylinder straight off the piston now? That's correct. Obviously you don't worry about saving gaskets because they would be replaced whatever happened. Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. You'd be looking to, uh, to renew them uh, regardless of what you were doing on the engine at this point in time. Dick, I notice a bit of contamination around the rings there. Is that fairly typical? This is a high time engine, isn't it? Yes, this, uh, this engine has probably done uh, about 400 hours. Um, the condition of the rings at this point in time without uh, having a really good close look look quite good. 
there's a little bit of retention in the uh, in the bottom ring area. Uh, very little blow by. We use uh, unleaded fuel, and unlike possibly the super, you do not get too much of uh, varnishes and resin buildups on the piston. They well, generally come out quite clean. We'll talk about fuel at some length uh, a little later because that's that's a really critical part of it all. The the holes in the top of the pistons. In the top of the skirt, what are those? On the for? side, yes. Well, these are uh, the later boost port uh, type piston. Uh, Rotax have found the need to um, assist lubrication and cooling of the gudgeon pin area. Uh, predominantly, that's why they're there for. They are not actually associated with a transfer uh, port as you see on most modern outboards. So it's merely a question of normalising the, uh, the temperatures within the engine using that port? That's correct, yes. And, uh, of course, we do have them sometimes inverted or we have them upright uh, which does uh, alter the lubrication somewhat this just gives a, a more even flow of cooling basically to the piston as well as to the gudgeon pin okay now the next step is obviously to clean those pistons up yes we'd we'll be looking to uh, to take them off even if we were just doing a, a decoke or we had a, a reasonably high hour and a re-ring uh, we would possibly just leave the pistons on as quite an acceptable practice to do that. We do have uh, coverings that you can make up uh, out of cardboard, this type of thing that uh, you can put over to protect the crankcase area. We don't want to be having any carbon contamination or whatsoever going down there. We've got needle bearings uh, which are uh, very susceptible to, uh, to grid ingestion. We want to try and prevent uh, any contamination or uh, grit, what have you, falling down into the, uh, the crankcase uh, openings. Uh, whilst we're working on the engine, we make up some cardboard type cutouts when we're pulling the needle bearing out. Likewise, we don't want to have uh, hardened steel bearings falling down. So they're just cut out of corrugated cardboard so that they, they actually fit tightly around the connecting rod and you can put a couple of bolts back in to hold them in. Yes, that's correct, Chris. Yeah, we just normally use a bit of cardboard or uh, any uh, type of uh, in plastic material, whatever. Um, just something that can be replaced quite easily when you're using them quite a lot. They do uh, have a habit of wearing out quite easily. Because people will tend to stuff a piece of rag down into, the, uh, into that area. I notice that you're protecting the PTO piston with a piece of rag, but the actual um, aperture there really should be protected with something rigid because if you use rag, when you pull it back out again, it sort of um, uncrumples, if you like, and it's likely to drop whatever grit is in it down into the uh, crankcase anyhow, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, it just makes for a lot cleaner working surface too because you're going to be working tools around here to be pulling uh, the piston out. Uh, it just makes it a lot, uh, lot easier. You can see if you do happen to drop anything and clear it. Okay, now the procedure for removing the gudgeon pin. There is a special tool available. Uh, we also have a tool to be able to pick the uh, circlips out of these. They use a, a round type circlip which can be a little bit difficult. Um, the piston pin itself can also be uh, a little bit tight. On a lot of occasions you do have to heat the piston up with, a like a, with the likes of a heat gun. Uh, we have the later cageless type of uh, gudgeon pin bearing which is 31 small needles that are quite easy to uh, dislodge and drop all over the place. So we'll get these tools and we'll show you exactly how to use them. We're removing the circlip from the gudgeon pin area. We find it a lot easier by altering a small screwdriver which we will show a bit further along the particular shape that you do it at. Rotate the engine stand enable us to get the other circuit the other side of the piston out. You have to be very careful with this procedure, they are very springy um, and you have to be careful they don't uh, fly out and cause some damage.
are they a replacement item or um, do you reuse those circlips? No, they are mandatory that you, uh, you renew them, Chris, regardless of uh, what sort of hours they are done. Once they are taken out, um, you stretch them and uh, they cannot be reused or should not be reused again. Uh, they can work loose uh, with disastrous results. This is uh, because it's got a needle bearing, we put a little installation tool on our drift to uh, knock the gudgeon pin out, uh, which will actually be left in there in the gudgeon pin and will uh, retain the needle bearing so they don't fall all over the place. So that follows the gudgeon <laughs> pin as it comes out and keeps the needle bearings in place? Yes, that's correct. So you're actually holding that piston so that you don't put a side load on the connecting rod? That's correct, yeah. We don't want to be putting uh, any jarring or, or sideways uh, load on it. So you just gently drift it through? That's correct. The little sleeve that I have in there, we tap it through uh, until we eyeball line it up with the gudgeon pin, with the, uh, the eye of the con rod. We can then lift the piston away. We have the sleeve holding the cageless needle bearing in place. Okay. We can either leave that in there if we are uh, just going to limit the amount of, uh, of repair work to that area. However, now an inspection of the gudgeon pin will tell you the condition of that bearing? Generally, or you can, uh, as indicated, you can, you can bring it out without disturbing it too much. Uh, it's showing a nice bright condition. Uh, if there was any galling or problems with it, they'd be dull and not shiny. There is a slight amount of, uh, of just blue surface tinge, which is generally normal with this type of bearing in this particular area. Uh, however, in this instance, we will pull it out uh, and I will just put a sleeve over that so that needles don't go everywhere. And in this instance, I'm using the plastic sheath uh, or sleeve which comes with each new bearing. Um, it's a good idea to retain them for uh, purposes uh, such as this. It's just pushed on slightly. You'll feel when it's, uh, it's actually grabbed the needles and then you can bring it out uh, so, so that keeps the bearing completely intact? That's correct. Uh, you just keep the thrust with it, which won't actually sit in there. I normally put them in a plastic bag and seal it up. Uh, I can then reuse this bearing uh, if I so desire, or in this instance I may replace it because of the particular hours on the engine. Uh, and as such, with this particular one, I would be putting new bearings in. This, that brings another point to mind, and that is the fact that uh, it's, it's essential to keep an, an, an engine logbook uh, so that you do know how many hours your engine has done. Uh, that's correct, Chris. Yeah, it's a, a, a pretty basic uh, or mandatory requirement um, through the, uh, the Australian Ultralight Federation that you do keep a logbook um, and all these particular things should be noted uh, and certainly ours because uh, we are basically writing the book as far as time between overhauls on various models go and uh, it's, it's quite critical um, for um, our point of view as well as your own that uh, hours are nominated and, and kept a record of. Dick, the bore in the little end there, um, what do you do as far as checking that is concerned? Uh, well there's not much uh, to it, Chris. If there is any problem you can normally see it on the surface as far as galling or discoloration goes you can get a small bore gauge uh, that would measure it. All right, well, we'll remove the other piston now. Uh, procedure's exactly the same as we did for the first one. After removal of the piston, uh, we just mark the uh, applicable PTO or mag, as the case may be, so we can put it back on exactly the same cylinder. Dick, one of the major factors in the success of Raytax worldwide has been their ability to engineer a reliable and effective gear reduction system, hasn't it? Yes, that's correct, uh, Chris. It's just a simple uh, 
uh, reduction arrangement that works very successfully. Now, uh, there's obviously maintenance uh, operations on that. What's the procedure there? Apart from the oil level being checked every 25 hours, Rotax maintenance schedule suggests that the torsion washers be inspected at 100 hours for correct preload and re-shimming if required. Okay, uh, what about removal procedure? Yes, uh, we'll drain the oil firstly. That's just a simple drain plug on the bottom? That's correct, yes, a plug uh, on the bottom. Now, it, it, should you change that oil at various uh, periods during the uh, life of the gearbox? Yes, there's a requirement uh, from brand new, the oil is changed in the first 10 hours and then every 100 hours or uh, annually. We use a 13 millimeter socket and wrench to remove the outer housing of the gearbox. The design of those has remained pretty well the same, Dick, hasn't it, since uh, the early days with some refinements? Yes, the, uh, the gearbox gearing wise is pretty much the same they've just changed they have an inbuilt torsional uh, shock absorber which uh, features a, a certain quantity of uh, concave Bellevue type washers and they've increased that to uh, give the gearbox a bit more loading capacity there is a gasket uh, between the gear housing and uh, the gear cover uh, the outer gear housing is also supported by two dowels uh, which require a slight tap uh, on a couple of the uh, lugs here just to uh, jar the removal of it. Some care should be taken because you do not want to damage the housing. Just slide the outer housing off the bolts. Well, our next step after removing the outer gear uh, housing is to take off the uh, inner gear housing, our 11 mil socket and socket wrench. We have only two cap screws holding this part of the housing to the crankcase. The inner boss area of this housing does have a small amount of Loctite on it from initial assembly so again just a small tap, normally just with the handle of the hammer will be sufficient. Our next step will be removing the actual drive gear. We'll rotate the engine around. For this exercise we need to lock the crankshaft up which we do by inserting our fixation rod which is uh, enclosed with each toolkit uh, for a new engine. It's most important that you do use this particular fixation uh, rod and not uh, an equivalent size of drill or just a high tensile uh, piece of rod. We rotate the crankshaft, there is a small hole in the crankshaft which this pin will locate into and lock it up. the crankshaft locked into position, we'll now use our three-quarter socket and a knuckle bar 
and remove the retaining bolt. There is a special tool required for this exercise of removing the, the gear. It's located uh, under a part number and is referred to in the manual. Care must be taken when removing this gear. Uh, it's under a fair amount of pressure and uh, will jump off rather, rather quickly. Our next step will be to remove the rotary valve cover. Tools for this is a 13mm socket and our socket wrench. Care must be taken with this cover. Uh, there is a floating rotary valve underneath it which uh, there is suction created with the oil between the cover and the valve whilst unscrewing the bolts hold the cover. If you have the plastic cover plugs in the carburetor mountings like I have, remove them. Without pulling the cover right off, we need to be able to push our finger, just break the suction between the rotary valve on the cover, holding your finger on there, just ease the cover off leaving the rotary valve still in place. It is good practice to mark the, uh, the rotary valve timing. We do this with the PTO piston or conrod at top dead centre the rotary valve will just be clearing the port. We just take a fine scraper, uh, scriber and just put a light mark along the side of the rotary valve, not too heavy, it won't hurt the housing, just so we can check the alignment later on. We'll now remove the uh, rotary valve uh, plate um, it is asymmetric, will only go one way, so we will mark it with a marking pen. Normally just out will be sufficient. To remove it, just rotate the crankshaft so that it half covers the port. This will allow you to grab it with your fingers and just ease it off. Our next step will be to remove the water pump impeller housing. For this we will need a 10 millimetre socket and our socket wrench. After removing the retaining bolts, we just use the hammer handle again for a, a small tap to break the seal between the gasket and the housing. Pull the housing off. This exposes our water pump impeller. Again, we need to use our fixation rod to lock the crankshaft into position to remove the impeller. The impeller is just a slip fit uh, on the shaft with a flat on one side to locate it for a drive.
Upon removing the impeller there is a friction washer, a serrated type washer and just one flat washer behind that one. Our next step is to remove the water pump impeller or seal supporting plate area. Uh, to do this, screw the nut back onto the shaft, insert our uh, fixation rod back into our crankshaft drilling. We just tighten the nut up. We will be levering on the end of this shaft very carefully. We don't want to damage the thread area. We don't want to damage the sealing area of the shaft. So if we get a screwdriver or, or preferably a, a small hook bar, something that you can just get in there either side, lever this supporting plate out. It doesn't matter if you damage this plate, it is has to be renewed and just work on it until you can lever the support plate off, bearing in mind to be careful not to damage the shaft. Okay, the support plate comes out, leaves the area clear to remove the seals. When we've split the crankcase, we will remove those when the shaft is tapped out. We can remove our nut again. And go on with our next step in the crankcase disassembly. We'll now remove the starter motor ring gear assembly. This will allow us access into the for the 582 engine into the CDI magneto hub area for the 532 we will then be gaining access to the stator plate contact breaker ignition system. Again, we use our fixation rod, insert it into locking the crankshaft, removing the ring gear, The ring gear is attached to a spacer uh, ring which is a certain amount of Loctite around it. Just ease the ring gear off the magneto hub. We'll now move on to removal of the magneto hub assembly. Again another special tool uh, is required for this. It uh, is called up in the manual. There is uh, quite a high tension on this particular nut. We need to use this type of tool in preference to our fixation rod that we've previously used uh, because of the possibility of twisting the crankshaft. That locates in the uh, Bendix aperture for the, for the starter motor in that rear housing deck. That's correct. Chris, there is uh, cutaways provided for that. We've locked that uh, plate up. We then use our knuckle bar and our socket and proceed to remove the nut. Now we're going to transition here from the 582 crankcase to a modified 532 crankcase, which is essentially the same, but it's had the rear housing removed so that the magneto hub is exposed. By this means we can show you far more clearly how the magneto hub fits and how the puller is used. The nut is removed along with the rear cover plate. Now we're installing the, uh, the locator onto that um, magneto hub, uh, not because it's able to do its job as a locator, it's already done that and it allowed us to loosen the main nut but because it also incorporates a, an internally threaded boss into which the actual hub puller fits. So it's essential to have that locator on. Obviously, when you're working on an engine with the full housing, um, you need that locator there in order to uh, resist the torque that you exert when you're using the actual drive bolt on the puller itself.
Now, under normal circumstances, as you exert the torque, the magneto uh, hub has been fixed onto the taper on the shaft using a Loctite material, a, a low grab Loctite, and it will come off with quite a, a definite click as we saw the main gear pulley come off. Work it back off the taper and we've exposed the ignition system on the back of the engine. Removing the magneto hub we've now gained access to the ignition contact point stator plate assembly which uh, is held on by two allen screw. We'll now remove those Tool required is a four millimeter Allen screw, Allen key. The loom off the stator plate travels through the crankcase via a hole, has a rubber plug, helps keep moisture out. The stator plate is just removed, eased off the end of the crankshaft and the loom brought through the hole. The final disassembly of the engine now involves removing it from this particular uh, engine stand to enable us to undo the crankcase retaining cap screws. We invert the engine on an already clean prepared part of the bench. Tools required here are 13 millimeter socket, socket wrench and a 6 millimeter allen key socket. These crankcase cap screws are tensioned up into a set pattern. When you're disassembling the crankcase, you also try to use that same uh, pattern, which is generally diagonally and working out from the center. After removal of the bolts, to split the crankcase, just ease a screwdriver into, uh, there's an, various as, access areas on the side of the crankcase, not directly on the, the actual mating faces. Just give it a slight lever up and the crankcase will come away from the other half. This then allows us into the crankshaft area. We go back to our, our rubber hammer, giving the crankshaft ends a slight tap on both ends. We help dislodge the bearings from in the tunnel bore area. Okay, we've now separated the crankshaft. That can now be moved to a, another more convenient area, covered over with a piece of rag to keep any contamination out of it, while we do the last and final segment of removing the rotary valve drive shaft assembly. To do this, we require a special tool that's listed in the manual. This is fastened to the end of the drive shaft to protect the thread, and we use it to impact with a hammer. Another very important part of this disassembly is the application of heat around this outer bearing area, which we do by means of a heat gun. So after warming the housing up, we will now be knocking on the end of the punch with the hammer. 
the rotary valve drive shaft will now come free of the lower crankcase area. This now just leaves the water pump seals which can be removed either um, by a screwdriver or a type of a hooked assembly that you can make up. We will not be using these seals again so we're not being too particular about damage to them. They don't take a great deal of removal. You'll note that uh, we still have the rotary valve drive shaft outer bearing still in place. We'll remove that by drifting it. That basically completes the disassembly of the, the crankcase. We'll now move on to cleaning the componentry. Dick, uh, obviously cleaning of all the components is the most important operation. How do we go about that? Yes, well, um, basically, uh, Chris, you know, we are looking to use uh, uh, petroleum type products or solvents. Uh, we have wire brushes, uh, this type of thing. We need to be cleaning gasket surfaces. Um, studs and nuts and bolts and this sort of thing. So you use a combination of, um, of scrapers, of scouring pads, of uh, stiff bristle brushes, uh, using say kerosene as your basic, uh, your basic solvent? Yes, that's, that's uh, correct Chris. Pretty basic stuff, the same as you would use uh, cleaning most uh, engine components and this style of thing. Because one thing you have to watch out with, with, uh, with that sort of cleaning setup, and in this particular case we're using a uh, uh, a proprietary parts cleaner is that over a period of time you'll get a grit build up and a contaminant build up in the solvent itself so you'd be, have to be very careful of that uh, in parts which you couldn't wash off with water afterwards wouldn't you? Yes that's correct um, there are certain components that you would want to possibly redo the second time in a clean uh, fluid, uh, some fresh kerosene or solvent, something of that nature. Fresh petrol even. Yes. Be even very careful being of, careful with it yes. With a, of its flammability. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dick, what about cleaning the carbon from the pistons? Um, carbon from the piston rings after a period of time is quite difficult. Um, you preferably would, would have a, uh, a, a brand name of a carbon solvent that you could maybe uh, soak the piston in overnight. However, these are not always available and probably won't be to uh, most of the people who use these engines. We would generally look at um, breaking a ring, you're certainly not reusing the ring when you come to rebuild time. We use a broken ring to clean the second uh, or bottom groove of the piston. Uh, the top groove, because of its dykes L-shaped, uh, you can't really use the piston, so we grind down a hacksaw blade and very carefully clean the carbon out of that particular ring. Now obviously this would have to be a, an operation that would be very carefully done, taking time to make sure that you didn't score the ring groove or remove too much aluminium from the piston itself. So you'd want to, you'd want to scrape rather than actually abrade. Yes, that's correct. Uh, you have to be very careful because we don't want to put any deep gouges uh, or heavy scratches, especially in the crown part of the piston which is subject to uh, combustion temperatures. A good uh, uh, scraper with a nice uh, face that's not going to scratch and then uh, we use probably a Scotch-Brite type scouring pad which does a real good job of, of cleaning the top surface up. Now Dick, what about crankshafts? They're uh, a little more demanding, aren't they? Yes, that's correct, Chris. We have uh, ball bearings and needle bearings, uh, some which we cannot remove. Even though the shaft is a pressed together fit, we are not uh, in normal rebuild removing it or pulling it apart. So we have to be very careful uh, as to not wash any other contaminations uh, back into these components that we're not removing. So in that case you would use a very clean solvent such as uh, petrol very carefully and you would uh, make sure that uh, uh, it was flushed uh, really thoroughly. That's correct, yes. I, I normally probably wash them twice. Uh, you can use a little bit of wet and dry on the end taper areas but uh, basically you're only just using a Scotch-Brite type uh, scouring pad to clean the exterior of the ball bearings and a nice uh, uh, brush to uh, clean the rest of the parts 
with petrol. Now, would you normally use a, a, a small amount of oil in the petrol? Yes, I generally uh, would. The, the final uh, clean would be not the normal petrol oil type mix that we use uh, in the two-stroke engine. It leaves a nice bit of a coating on the inside of the bearings after you've blown it dry with air. So you blow it with air and you evaporate the petrol and leave a, a, a light, very fine coating of oil over, over all of the components. That's correct, yes. After you finish with the solvent, blow dry it with air and then uh, wrap it up or put it in a plastic bag. And the same applies to all the other components. Blow dry it with air and make sure that it's properly protected uh, but while you're storing it preparatory to rebuilding the engine. That's correct, yes. Yeah. Now Dick, obviously before we put the engine back together we have to ascertain what parts can be reused and what parts need to be replaced and there's a series of tests and measurements that you make on the various components to ascertain whether they're within the normal life wear limits. Yes, that's correct uh, Chris. We're now looking at uh, checking those components on the crankshaft. As you can see we have the, uh, the crankshaft suspended in two V blocks we have a magnetic base dial indicator with a dial gauge. We're testing here for possible bend of the crankshaft, uh, which will show up on the dial gauge. There is a specification called up in the book and it is something like three thousandths of an inch maximum. We're also looking, we can pick up by this means to see if we have any excessive movement uh, that's up and down movement, uh, excessive wear in the balls of the ball bearing. And this will also be picked up. As you can see there, we have no movement um, and they would be quite okay for reuse. We do this with the outer ball bearings as well, the same test. Because uh, one of the problems with the ball bearings is that they do have some slop uh, longitudinally um, and that can lead you to believe that they're worn and that they do have lateral play. Yes, but that's, that's, uh, that's not the case in most, most cases. No, that's, that's quite correct, Chris. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing. You can feel the side play uh, the only way to test it, you can either, you can feel it yourself, but you really need to have the likes of this uh, dial gauge mounted on so you can uh, properly ascertain whether there is any clearance there or not. Now what about the, um, the big ends on the crank pin clearance? <laughs> yes, there is uh, side play built into the, uh, the crankshaft via thrust washers either side. There is a specification for those and checking them is just by feeler gauge pushed into the side, check the various feelers and see exactly how much you have there and compare it with what's in the book. Okay, there are other components that have to be checked as well. We have, um, of course, needle roller bearings, which are located on the, uh, the big end bearing. Uh, it can only just be an eyeball inspection, basically, from these, even though you can uh, to some degree, if there is a bad amount of wear, you can physically feel it by pulling and pushing the conrod. Um, however, the best idea is to uh, physically view the needle rollers by working the conrod backwards and forwards. The needle should have a bright, glossy uh, appearance. If they look dull or grey, there is a good possibility that they are starting to gall and the whole conrod should be replaced. 